Hello, and welcome to another video on legends and myths. Today I'll be telling you the story of the famous trickster god, Loki, the god of mischief. In Norse mythology, Loki is a cunning trickster god who has the ability to shapeshift into any animal, person, or sex. He is the son of the Jotun, Farbauti, and of the goddess Laufey, and also the brother of Helblindi and Bylister. He is married to the goddess Sigyn, which they had two sons, Narfi, Onari, and Vali. He also had three other children by the Jotun, Angerboda, who were Hel, the goddess of death, the great wolf Fenrir, and the world serpent Jörmungandr. In the form of a mare, Loki was impregnated by the stallion Svadilfari and gave birth to the eight-legged horse Sleipnir. In Norse myths, Loki is portrayed as a cunning, devious, and also as a scheming coward who cares only for shallow pleasures and self-preservation. He can be seen as playful, malicious, and helpful, but he's always irreverent and nihilistic. For example, in the tale of the kidnapping of Idun, Loki, by his recklessness, ends up in the hands of the furious Jotun, Thiazi, who threatened to kill Loki unless he brings him the goddess Eden, who was the goddess of spring and rejuvenation. Loki complies in order to save his life, and then finds himself in an awkward position of having the gods threaten him with death unless he rescues Eden. He agrees to this request for the same base motive, shapeshifting into that of a falcon and carrying the goddess back to Asgard in his talons. Thiazi then pursues him desperately in the form of an eagle, but having almost caught up with Loki as he is near his destination, the gods light a fire around the perimeter of their fortress. The flames caught Thiazi and burned him to death, while Idun and Loki reach the halls of the gods safely. Loki ultimately comes to the aid of the gods, but only to rectify a calamity for which he himself is responsible. After Thiazi's death, the giant's daughter, Skadi, arrives in Asgard demanding restitution for the slaying of her father. Now you would think she would be demanding the gods to pay her a large quantity of silver or gold, but her only demand was for them to make her laugh, something which only Loki can do. To accomplish this, he ties one end of a rope to the beard of a goat and the other end to his testicles. Both he and the goat squawk and squeal as one pulls one way and the other pulls the other way. Eventually, he falls over in Scotty's lap, and the giantess couldn't help but laugh at such an absurd spectacle. Here, Loki once again comes to the aids of the gods, but simply by being silly and outlandish. He alternately helps both the gods and the Jotuns, depending on which course of action is most pleasurable and beneficial to him at the time. As a member of the Aesir tribe of deities, Loki, along with Odin, Thor, and Freya, constituted as one of the four ruling deities of Norse mythology, where Thor, Freya, and even Odin strove to impose a righteous order amongst the gods, Loki's erratic behavior called the very nature of his allegiances into question. In truth, Loki was neither for or against the gods, like the trickster figures of other mythologies. He was neither good nor evil, choosing instead to be a partisan of disorder itself, a figure who tested boundaries and challenged conventions. His chaotic inconsistency reminded believers that the boundaries between good and evil were far more tenuous than they suspected. In one myth, it is said that Loki was in the mood for a great prank, so one night as Thor's wife, Sif, was sleeping, he cut off the goddess's hair. When Thor discovered this, he was so enraged that he confronted Loki and grabbed hold of him. As the situation was getting out of hand, Loki promised Thor a replacement, that Sif's new hair would be of real gold, and thus even more beautiful and luxurious than her natural hair. Thor was initially skeptical, but agreed after being convinced by Loki. To fulfill his promise, Loki approached the dwarf Ivaldi with the request. The sons of Ivaldi not only crafted an exquisite headpiece for Sif, but made other gifts for the gods as well. These included the foldable ship, Skidbladnir for Freyr, the god of peace and fertility, and the spear Gungnir for Odin. Though Loki's task was complete, the mischievous god wondered what else he may extract out of the talented dwarfs. He thus approached the brothers Brock and Sindri, 
and bet his own head that the craftsman could not better the work of Ivaldi's sons. Taking the challenge, Sindri was the first on the job, and despite being bitten by a fly on his hand, he managed to create the Gullinborsti for Friar, an exquisite golden boar who was faster than any horse apart from Odin's Sleipnir. Brock then created another perfect item despite the fly biting his neck, the golden ring Draupnir for Odin, which created eight new rings of gold every nine nights. Finally, Brock began work on Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, which was a weapon that never missed its target and flew back into its owner's hand after it made its hit. This time Brock was bitten on his eyelid, and being blinded by the sting, the dwarf made the hammer's handle slightly short to be considered perfect. Unsurprisingly, it was the shape-shifting Loki that had taken the shape of a fly to save his own head, and succeeded only by a slim margin. As his adventure was over, he now possessed six legendary items that would empower the gods in their pursuits. In another myth, called the Loka Senna, is when Loki has a flighting match, in other words, a verbal battle between him and the gods, during a feast given by the sea god Gymir. Once Gymir invited all the gods to a feast, he appointed his two servants, Fima Fung and Eldir, to welcome the guests as they entered. The troublemaker Loki, however, grew incredibly jealous during the praises and slew Fima Fung in a fit of rage. He was thus driven away by the gods who then feasted and drank in the hall. Loki, however, returned to the feast yet again and demanded a seat and ale. On being told that he was unwelcome by Bragi, god of poetry, Loki reminded Odin of an ancient oath and got himself invited to the table. He then challenged Bragi and questioned his courage, thereby insulting him. When Idun, Bragi's wife, tried to hold back her husband, Loki called her a sexually loose woman. Gefjan, goddess of unmarried woman, was the next to speak, whom Loki silenced with a critique. When Odin interrupted him, the All-Father was not spared either, and Loki called him unjust and unmanly. Odin's wife Frigg, goddess of marriage and fertility, then tried to calm the guests down by saying that old tales should not be retold. Loki, however, targeted her as well as accusing her of betraying Odin for sleeping with his two brothers, Vili and Vi. The conversation continued with Freya, Njord, Tyr, and Bigvir confronting Loki and each receiving a piece of Loki's sharp tongue. Finally, Thor, who was absent during the feast, arrived and immediately warned Loki to be silent. Loki then began abusing the God of Thunder, questioning Thor's anger and taunting him saying that Thor will not be so bold to fight against the wolf when he swallows Odin at Ragnarok, the end and twilight of the gods. He further made fun of Thor's journeys to the east, where Thor supposedly cowered under the glove of the giant Skrymir. Thor became furious and threatened Loki with his hammer. Finally, Loki left the scene saying that he had shown the gods and their sons the sharp edge of his tongue. Loki also complimented Thor before leaving, saying only Thor's threats may be taken seriously. Now, here is where things get worse, for in this myth called The Death of Baldur, a tragic tale which would lead to the beginning of Ragnarok. Baldur was the most handsome among the Aesir. He was the god of light, joy, and summer suns, and the son of Odin and Frigg, king and queen of the Aesir. Once Baldur and his mother Frigg both had the same dream, a nightmare regarding Baldur's death. The dream deeply disturbed Baldur, who soon became depressed. To reassure her beloved son, Frigg made every object and material on Earth take an oath to never hurt Baldur in any way. All objects made this vow except mistletoe. Unfortunately, the mischief-making Loki became aware of this. The gods were once engaged in a new pastime of hurling objects at Baldur, which would bounce off to everyone's amusement. Loki thus made a magical arrow of mistletoe and hurried to the place of recreation. Loki then gave the weapon to Baldur's brother, the blind god Hodor, who was tricked and guided by Loki into shooting the mistletoe arrow, which he inadvertently killed his brother with it. Hearing of her son's death, 
Frigg was devastated and resolved to change his fate. She sent Hermoder, messenger god, and Baldur's brother to Helheim to ransom Baldur's soul. Hel, goddess of death, agreed but on one condition, that all living things should weep for Baldur. Frigg was quick to set about the task and was able to convince all but one, a giantess named Thok, which may have been none other than Loki in disguise. Thus, Baldur could not be saved and had to stay in the underworld. Loki has always brought trouble to the gods, but his involvement in Baldur's death meant that their patience had run out with him. Loki soon realized that the gods would now come after him and fled from Asgard, the realm of the gods. He hid on top of a mountain where he built himself a house with four doors so that he could watch his pursuers from all directions. During the day, he would shape-shift himself into a salmon and hide in the waters nearby, and by night, he would fish for his food to sustain himself. The gods were indeed looking for Loki, seeking for his punishment, and Odin perceived his whereabouts. When Loki saw the gods approach, he burnt his fishing net, quickly transformed into a salmon, and hid in the water. The gods sewed their own net and tried to catch him, but Loki successfully evaded them. Knowing well that it would be impossible to evade the net forever, Loki decided to take a big risk by jumping downstream and swimming to the sea. However, when the salmon finally made the leap, it was caught by Thor. Loki struggled to be free, but Thor held him fast by his tail fins. After having captured the trickster god, the gods decided to punish him. Loki was then taken to a cavern and meted out a cruel punishment for his misdeeds. His two sons, Vali and Nari, were summoned. Vali was transformed into a wolf, who then killed his own brother, Nari, leaving his entrails across the cave floor. Loki was now tied to the rocks with the entrails of his own son, and Skadi, goddess of hunting, placed a poisonous snake on a rock above his head, where it dripped venom onto his face. Loki's devoted wife, Sigyn, stayed with him in his cave holding a dish above her husband's face to collect the venom and protect him. But every once in a while the dish would be full, and she would be compelled to turn away and empty it. At these moments, the venom dripped on Loki's face, which he would then scream and writhed in pain so loud that the very earth trembled. Loki would remain in the cave until the beginning of Ragnarok. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more videos like this to come, and feel free to let me know what other deities you would like for me to cover next. Take care, and I'll see you in the next myth.